said or something is played in this church, I try to look in my Bible and find it. That's a good thing. Because as they were singing that song, I turned my Bible to Revelations chapter 5, and it says, And then I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, and the living creatures, and the elders, and the number of them was myriads of myriads, and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessings. And listen to what it says. And every created thing which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all things in them I heard saying to him who sits on the throne, to the Lamb, be blessings and honor, glory and dominion, and power forever and ever. Amen. 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 Let's give a hand to the Lord for what he's done. Amen. Father, we thank you so much for today. We thank you because we can gather together. God, we can sing praises unto your name and sing about the days to come. God, as Christians, we look at that day in eager expectation, knowing that there will be a day when people of all nations will surround the throne, and in one voice, in unity, we will say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, and we'll be singing praises forevermore. So, Lord, this day, I pray that you allow our ears to be open. And our hearts to be open to receive your word. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. One of the things that we are preparing for today is Memorial Day. And on Memorial Day, traditionally, we celebrate or we remember the young men and women who have died in combat or during service in our country. And so today, we want to say thank you to them and to their families for the ultimate sacrifice they paid in defense of our country. Amen. And then I can't help to think about the families of those slain men and women, servicemen and women. If you have a service member who passed away, someone in your family, can you please just raise your hand? Okay, man, it's quite a few people. Hey, Amen. Thank you so much. I want to say thank you to you. Because this was something in life that you did not probably expect. Although people join the service, you don't expect for them to go away. You don't expect to never see them again as they serve. And so there, in life, there are many things that we don't expect. And when those things happen, sometimes it takes us in a very, very bad place. Like, I'll give you a good example. My daughter and I, my son and I also, we travel uh, at least once a year when we go different places and see different things. And on our way back, we were in (laughs) Gainesville, and we were coming back through Gainesville. (laughs) And we went to this place, incredible place. And it's actually a factory. And this factory makes cakes. And inside this cake, they put cheese in it. And I love this factory. <laughs> Me and my daughter go there, and man, we, we go there, and we look at all the wonderful things in this factory, and, and I'm telling you, we you know, lean down, and we look inside, and they're like, man, what are you getting? And on our last trip, there was a lady from this town standing right next to me, and I'm not shy at all. And I look at her, and I say, what are you getting? She said, oh... I'm getting the cheesecake with Cinnabon mix in it. I said, oh, glory. (laughs) Lady, where have you come from? And I said, give me that piece of cheesecake. So we got the cheesecake and we ate it. And I said, you know, it wasn't really what I expected. It was good. You know, it was all right. But it, it wasn't really that shebang, pow, stars in the sky type of dessert. It was okay. 
And then I start thinking of, you know, Lord, what happens when we expect something and it doesn't come to what we actually expect? It doesn't meet our expectations. Sort of like when you order online and you order something in an extra large and you get it back and it looked like it's for your, your in, infant son. You know, you order that and, and it wasn't what you expected. Or you've studied all day for a test and you have prayed earnestly saying, Lord, help me to get a good grade on this test. And when the test finally comes back, it's not such a good grade. Or what about this? You pray earnestly for a spouse. And when that spouse finally comes, and y'all are fighting and arguing all the time, and you say, Lord, this isn't what I expected. This is not. Lord, I prayed. I remember praying and asking you for this person. And, and when this person came in, I was overjoyed. But God, I did not expect this. Or you have a child. And you prayed to the Lord for that child, and you sought the Lord for that child, and when you finally got that child, that child went way, wayward, and you were asking the Lord, Lord, I prayed for this. What is the meaning of this? It didn't fit your expectations. Or you got moved to a city in a little part of Georgia, but a whole bunch of gnats. <laughs> and you get here and you say, God, this wasn't what I expected. I expected something different. God, I prayed and I sought you and I asked the question, how, how do I get over this? How? And, and so the question now comes for me is, God, how, how do I get over this? God, how do I become comfortable in obviously the place that you sent me? How is a believer uh, supposed to strive or excel or celebrate the great things the Lord has done when you're in a place and you say, God, I don't know if I'm supposed to be here or not? So turn in your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 17. 1 Kings chapter 17. In 1 Kings, you will see the account of the kings of Israel. You will begin to see King David, who is the king of Israel, now beginning to pass away, and he is passing the baton of leadership onto his son Solomon. And as Solomon uh, uh, takes the reins of the kingdom, he does some very incredible prayers, and he's asking God for wisdom, and God makes him wise, one of the wisest men on the earth. And it's, you know, to watch and look at that story in the Bible, it's an incredible account of how God blesses him and gives him wisdom. But in chapter 11, something happens. The Bible says Solomon loved foreign women. And at that point, they begin to turn his heart away from God. God is very upset at, at, at Solomon, and he says, Solomon, you know, uh, man, I really wanted to do this for, to you and, and make, your, make your name established forever, but I can't do this in disobedience. So I'm going to rip part of the kingdom from your son. And so as he rips, the, God rips the kingdom from here, you see the children of Israel actually split now. And they go into two kingdoms, the kingdom of Judah and then you have the kingdom of Israel. And they start pushing forth in history in that particular way. And throughout, particularly the children of Israel, they have eight kings. And then they come down to a king by the name of Ahab. The Bible talks about Ahab in chapter 16. It starts telling about how this man was so wicked. The Bible says he was more wicked than every king before him. He continued in idolatry and, and raising up Baals in, the, in that place and, and forgetting the name of God. And so God wants to do something to get the attention of the children of Israel and say, hey, come back to me, the one and only true God. And so he sends a man. He sends a man there by the name of Elijah. 
All of you are familiar with Elijah because if you read the Bible for any amount of time, you will see several accounts in the Bible that talk about Elijah. As a matter of fact, as Jesus was walking the earth, people thought he was Elijah. You will also read in James chapter 5, verse 17, it talks about Elisha coming and, and this Elisha and his prayer and how he stayed the rain for three and a half years and it talks about his faith. As a matter of fact, he was one of the ones on Mount Transfiguration when Jesus brought the rest of the disciples up. It was, him, it was Jesus, Moses, and Elijah. This Elijah. And in this particular part of the scripture, this is his very first time appearing in the scriptures. And so let's read Elijah, about Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 17. If you have your Bible, if you have a device, I implore you to read this. Look at this. It says, Now Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the settlers of Gilead, said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives. Now remember, Ahab is a very wicked king. And so it takes something to walk up to a very wicked king and proclaim something. Here it is. He says, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, before whom I stand, surely there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. The word of the Lord came to him, saying, Go away from here and turn eastward and hide yourself by the brook of Cherith, which is east of the Jordan, and it shall be that you will drink of the brook, and I have commanded the raisins to provide for you there. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord, and he went and lived by the brook of Cherith, which is east of the Jordan. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and the meat in the evening, and he would drink from the brook. And it happened after a while that the brook dried up because there was no rain in the land. And as I read that scripture, I start thinking to myself the question that I had posed earlier I said, God, why would you take Elijah, a man who was praying and seeking after your heart, and you would take him, make him run up to a king who was evil, would have probably killed him, and then say, hey, now run away. It's almost like running up to the bully on the preschool playground and said, hey, na 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 and take it off running. That's what God did. He says, hey, go tell him this. Now run away. Elijah runs away, and he runs and maintains himself by the brook of Cherith, and God is feeding him with ravens, and by the brook, he's allowing him to drink from the brook. But all of a sudden, the brook dries up. And I said again, I said, God, why would you send a man to a particular place only to strip away the resources that you had given him? How many people in here feel that way sometimes? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> Feels like you asked God for something, and you feel like you heard, you really actually heard God, but when you got to that place, it was not what you expected. The resources that God had once supplied are now starting to dry up. And friends, I don't know about you, but that is a very, very hard place to be. Because when the resources start dry up, you start to have questions. God, did I really hear you? God, I thought you really wanted me to be happy. Or you say something like, God, you know, I was willing, God, but, but after I didn't hear from you, I just, I just went my own way. What do you do in situations like that? There is no doubt in my mind, there are some of you in here today, and you have a big decision to make. You have prayed about it. You've talked to people about it. And God has moved you in that area, and now you are sitting here, and it feels like God has just pulled the rug from right up under you. And you're asking the question, what now? What happens when the brook dries up? So let's look at the life of Elijah. Let's see what he does in this particular instance. The first point would be, when you find yourself in dry seasons, 
Remind yourself of your relationship with God. Amen. When you find yourself in these seasons, remind yourself of your relationship with God. If you look at verse number one in this particular, in this particular chapter, it says, Now Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the settlers of Gilead, said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, before whom I stand, listen, he is making it very clear who he stands before. He says, Ahab, I know I'm standing before you, but guess what? It's not about you. <laughs> it's about the God who I serve. That's why I'm here. You see, when you go somewhere and you don't realize that God has sent you there, it would be easy to leave. I get an amen from somebody in here. It's easy to leave when you, don't, when you know God didn't send you there. And so in this particular point, I want to give you two things that Ahab says, and I kind of interpret from this particular scripture. He says, I won't do anything and I won't say anything until God tells me. I'm not doing anything and I'm not saying anything until God says so. Look at this verse, John chapter 6, verse 38. Write that down in your Bible. I won't do anything. John chapter 6. Matter of fact, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to that. John chapter 6, verse 38. Listen to the words of Jesus. See what Jesus does in situations like this. John chapter 6, verse 38. Jesus says in this particular verse, he says this, For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of the one who sent me. When we are able as Christians to wrap our minds around your life is not your own, I came to do the will of the one who sent me, your life will be much better. It will be much better. You see, sometimes we get to the point where we're thinking, I can do this on my own and I make my own decisions. I'm, my se I'm a self-made man or woman and I can make these decisions and, and, and I have this wisdom that I got from college and this, you know, and I can do these things because I've done them before. And, and Elijah says, hey, uh-uh, no, no. I do only what he tells me to do. Jesus says that in John chapter 6. I do only what he tells me to do. And many, many times the problem will come when we step outside and say, God, I'm going to do things on my own accord. Look at the next one. I won't say anything. John chapter 8, verse 28. Look at that. Just a few pages over. This is what Jesus is saying. And if you are a disciple of Jesus Christ, we are following the ways of Jesus. And he says this. So Jesus said, when you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he, and I do what? Nothing on my own. You see that? But I speak the things that the Father has taught me. I'm not doing anything and I'm not saying anything unless God tells me. This is the place Elijah was in. So when you find yourself in a desert place, when the brook has all dried up, you need to, number one, remind yourself of where you are in God and your relationship with God. Number two. I'm reminding myself of my relationship with God, but I am also listening closely for the voice of God. Listening closely for the voice of God. Look at verse 2 through 4, and it says, The word of the Lord came to him, saying, and this is 1 Kings chapter 17, The word of the Lord came to him, saying, Go away from here and turn eastward and hide yourself by the brook of Cherith, which is it is east of the Jordan, and it shall be that you will drink of the brook, and I will command the ravens to provide for you there. You see that? He says, listen closely. When I find myself in a desert place, I remind myself of who I am in God, and then I start listening closely for his voice. This is very, very key. I'm listening for God's voice. Number one, I am listening for God's voice. Uh, voice through the scriptures. Amen. I'm reading my Bible daily, asking the Lord, Lord, will you please speak to me through your word? 
This is the number one way that the Lord speaks is through his word. Second, I am coming to him in prayer. I'm asking him in prayer, God, please help me. I need direction and decision. God, I am in a stressful time in my life, and I, and I need to know exactly what you're saying. And so I'm going to break some time away, and I'm going to come to you in prayer, going before the Father. But then also, there is a point that I didn't put on the board, and I want you to write it down. Because this point spoke to me. Sometimes I'm like, yeah, God, that's good. Oh, man, God, they're going to get this. Oh, yeah. And then it's like, right through the heart. This point, the third point there, is stillness. Stillness. One of the things that the pandemic taught me is to be still. If I'm in a desert place, and the brook has dried up, and there are no resources, and things seem to be going all, you know, haywire, God says, you know what? You need to be still and know that I am God. His word, prayer, and stillness. Amen? Let's look at point number three. So I'm reminding myself of my relationship with God. I'm I'm listening closely for the voice of God. And then, watch this. Stay where you are until God speaks. Stay where you are until God speaks. When you're looking at this particular verse, Elijah does not move. He never moves until he hears God speaks. There are temptations in life, and your own um, uh, intellect will cause you to say, you know what, I think it's time for me to move on. I think I'm just going to go to another place. I'm going to look at this because I start looking at the map and where the brook of Cherith was, and I was like, okay, God, this is approximately where it is, you know. And so, but the Bible also talks about how this river also ran into the Jordan. I said, well, you know, if I were Elijah, I'd like, hey, the brook dried up. Well, why don't I just walk a few more meters down here to the Jordan River and get all my water from there? It would sound like the logical thing to do. But God never tells Elijah to move. And sometimes when things get uncomfortable and the pot starts getting hot and that water starts boiling, you start pulling up your pants leg, just kind of getting out of here and saying, Lord, this is getting too hot for me. And in fact, God is saying, Stay where you are. There are three points that are not on the board that I want to give you. Number one, when you are in this position, the path will be unfamiliar. The path will be unfamiliar. Oh, they are on the screen. I'm sorry. The path will be unfamiliar. So walk with God. The path will be unfamiliar, so walk with God. Walking with God means a daily life, a daily life where I am acknowledging him through prayer, reading the word, spending time, meditating in his word. I am, I am looking for him. I am seeking him. I'm walking only where he tells me to walk. The path will be unfamiliar, so I need guidance. Secondly, the journey will be uncomfortable. The journey will be uncomfortable. I don't know where this is written at. I don't know who came up with it. But someone has fooled us as Christians to think we will never go through anything. Someone said, when you get saved, you will never have to worry about a thing again. (laughs) And that, my friend, is not true. The difference is, when we have Jesus... He walks with us through the trials of life. And when he walks with us through the trials of life, he gives us strength to endure the temptations of life. That's the difference. And so the journey for you as Christians will not be comfortable. It will be uncomfortable. But when the journey gets uncomfortable, call on God. When it's unfamiliar, you walk with God. When it gets uncomfortable, you start calling on God. 
in several places in Scripture, especially in the Old Testament, you will see people, when they started going through things, the first thing they did is they called on God. Well, it wasn't the first thing they did. It was like the second or fourth or fifth. But they started calling on God, and when they called on God, God answered their prayer. The path will be unfamiliar. The journey will be uncomfortable. The last one, the future will be beyond your control. You can't stop it. You can't stop it. I just get the picture of us trying to take our dog to the kennel. And the dog just putting the brakes on, you know, just like sitting down. You can't stop it. It's beyond your control. And so when times get like that, when the future is beyond your control, you've got to trust God. You've got to trust him. I know it's hard. I know you've done things on your own for so many years, but you have to trust God. And what does trusting God look like? That means I'm taking time out. I'm dedicating my time, making sure I'm reading God's word, and I'm sitting down, peeling it open. I know my day is getting busy over here, but I need to make sure I'm spending time with the master because inside my time with the master, he's going to tell me everything I need to know for that day. Give us this day our daily bread. Trust him. He's going to tell you to do some things. Talk to some people. Say some things that only line up with his word. Amen? Let's go on to the fourth one, fourth point. And when you're sitting down and you're hearing God and you are listening to his voice and, and you know, you're reminding yourself, you know, you need to act immediately on his word. In scripture, you see Elijah. He never hesitates based on the scripture to fulfill God's word for his life. He never hesitates. So when you hear God speaking, immediately act on his word. Pastor Mark got up this morning and talked about serving. I had had to put serving in here somewhere. Y'all knew that. He talked about serving. Some of you, your heart leaped. And then after a few minutes, you went back and said, oh, yeah, that's a good idea, but I don't think I'm going to do it today. You need to be acting on what God is calling you to do. A delayed obedience is not obedience at all. It's disobedience. Delayed obedience is not obedience. It's disobedience. And so as we act and we uh, act in obedience, I'm sorry, as we immediately follow God's word, this is the last thing. And I love this. I love this. As Elijah was going through that desert place, he was listening for God's voice. He, in, he understood who he was. He didn't immediately go out. He stayed where he was, and he acted when God finally spoke to him. But this is the point that believers need to understand. Your deliverance is not always about you. You see, sometimes we get so caught up in in our own comfort, and I want things to be better for me. God, what about me? What about my feelings? What about how this person has hurt me? What about how my job, on my job with my boss, disrespects me? It's all about me. And God tells you, stay right there. Stay right there. He said, no, God, but it's time. Stay right there. Stay right there. And as I look in 1 Kings chapter 17, because of Elijah's obedience, God finally tells him, all right, now I want you to go to a place called Zarephath. And in that place, a widow woman will be there and she will feed you. Now, watch this. As Elijah goes completely thirsty, following God's word, he meets this widow woman, and she says, in today's terms, man, I don't have enough to feed my own household. How am I going to give you something? And when she does, the oil in her house continues to flow, and I can guarantee you 
that increased her faith in the Lord because of his obedience. Is it hard? Absolutely. Is it hard being a place and you're being persecuted and, and beat down? Absolutely. And no one should ever subject themselves to physical punishment. But I'll tell you, there are some times, my brothers and sisters, when we just don't want to be uncomfortable anymore. And we search the scriptures and we try to find reasons why. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And you say, you know what, God, you said this, so I am going to go ahead and remove myself from the situation because I read this one passage in Scripture that talks about my happiness and talks about my comfort. That's not what he tells Elijah. Elijah stays where he is until God speaks. When the brook runs dry, When the brook runs dry, do not trade your honest obedience for habitual comfort. When the brook runs dry, don't trade that. Stay in God's will. Stay where you are. Stay where you are. I know without a shadow of a doubt, as we prepare to close and the the orchestra can come up and I know without a shadow of a doubt, some of you, you got your bags packed, boy, you got stuff ready to go. You're like, man, this is it. This is the last hoorah. I've got, you know, gas in my tank. I'm ready to pull out of here. And this, the last thing I'm going to see is this place in my rearview mirror or this person in my rearview mirror. And God has not told you that. And he's telling you to stay where you are. Stay where you are. So I want us to pray. I want us to pray, number one, that you're obedient to God's call. That you're obedient to his call. If he is telling you and speaking something to you and you know without a shadow of a doubt it is God speaking to you, be obedient to his word. Now, the other flip side of that is there are some people in here and you don't have a relationship with God and you're trying to hear God and it's very difficult, yet you can't hear him because you don't even have a relationship with him. And you're trying to mimic things that Christians do, trying to be inside the will of God and you don't have the relationship yet. We got to get that piece ready first. We got to get that ready first. And then allow God to speak to your heart. Listen, he loves you. He loves you. You're his child. Why would he want you to go through all these hard times in your life without an anchor? It doesn't make sense. So God is calling all of us to a deeper relationship with him. By trusting. God, I don't understand this. God, I don't know why this is happening. But God is telling you, trust me. One of the greatest promises in Scripture, Jesus says this, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I won't leave you. No, no, no. I know people have walked out on you and made you feel bad. But listen, I will never leave you nor forsake you. The Holy Spirit is there with you. Amen? So let us pray. Father, we thank you so much this morning for this word. God, just like we started off, Father, I, you know, I've got to admit, sometimes, God, I have been ready to abandon ship. But as I looked at my relationship with you, I talked about how great you are and how wonderful you've been. I start thinking, God, I haven't even heard from you. This is something that I'm doing on my own will. I haven't heard from you. So, God, I pray today for renewed relationships with you today. Life may not have met our expectations, 
But Lord, I pray that we all from today forward would walk in obedience unto you. Lord, we thank you so much. And we love you with our whole hearts, God. And I also pray if there's someone here today who does not know Jesus and to partner their sins and, and, and you are looking to make the next step, today is the day to make that step. Listen, you know God is calling you. Why wait another day? Give your life to Jesus. And just like we celebrate Memorial Day, celebrate the one who gave his whole life for us. So, Father, we thank you so much. We pray that you'll be with us. In Jesus' name, amen. As we, say, as we stand, the choir is going to sing. And we're going to have some pastors down front. If you say, you know what, Pastor Ken, I really really need to get my life together. I need to get some things on track. I haven't been following God. I have, you know, just been outside of his will, and I've been doing things on my own, and God, today was a confirmation of that. Just come on down. Don't be ashamed. It'd be better to be inside the will of God to be outside prideful. So we ask, as the choir sings, will you come? Men are standing at the front. Teach me to follow you and obey your truth. Always, always, and with all. Me to follow, teach me to follow you and obey your truth. Oh, always, always, and with all. Be seated for just a moment, would you please? Such a great word for us uh, this morning. And if you're here today, you're watching online, and God was speaking to you during that message, and you realize that maybe you are sitting by the brook, or maybe you're sitting by a table of plenty. But the thing that's missing in your life right now is the presence of God. And you don't have a personal relationship with Him. I encourage you, if you're watching online, and you know that you're in that position and you're ready to trust Christ as your Lord and Savior. Follow the instructions below. Fill out that next step tab and we will follow up with that. And we'd love to tell you how you can personally have a relationship with Christ. 
Or if you're here today and you are also sitting in that boat outside in our atrium as a next step table, what I would tell you is this. God is faithful and he is good and he has offered his son to us. The greatest thing that God has given us is not us sitting by the brook and the ravens coming and bringing in food. It is his presence that's there at the brook or at the widow house. So his presence is our greatest possession. And I encourage you today, don't walk out of this space, out of this church, without trusting him as Lord and Savior. We'd love to meet you there and pray with you. Also, if you're new to Sherwood, thank you so much for being here today.